So last week and this week, we've been talking about theories of art that pay special attention to the aesthetic feelings that they engender in us. And I was explaining last week that these aesthetic feelings are supposed to be special sorts of feelings that uh, are uh, of a certain kind, different from feelings of taste or smell or touch. And usually the, the, the aesthetic feelings that are noted are one, beauty, which we talked about last week. And this week we're talking about a second kind of aesthetic emotion or feeling, namely the sublime. Now, what the heck do people mean by the sublime? Well, uh, in general, the sublime is supposed to be a feeling in which you uh, feel threatened by something, but then feel your own ability to overcome this thing that is threatening you. So in the readings this week, I've given you uh, two readings again, one by Kant and the way that he talks about the sublime, and another by uh, Schopenhauer and uh, his characterization of the sublime. So I'll talk about Kant first. So Kant has two different kinds of sublime. He says there's the mathematical sublime and there's the dynamic sublime. And for him, the difference is in the different ways that these uh, things we encounter threaten to overwhelm us or, or overcome us in some way. So the, the, with the mathematical sublime, what threatens to overcome us is the sheer quantity or number of things. So Kant thinks that we can experience the feeling of the mathematical sublime when, say, you go up and look at the stars at night, especially if you're like out on the, the beach in Lake Michigan, away from all the, the city lights, and you just see there's, there's so many stars. It just outstrips the power of your, uh, your senses to be able to count them all and to perceive the full number of stars. You might also uh, experience the feeling of the mathematical sublime looking out on the horizon of Lake Michigan or the ocean and realizing that the expanse, the distances, are just so vast you can't really capture with your sight of the horizon just how vast those distances are. So there's the sense in which the sheer number of stars or the sheer size of the earth overwhelms our ability in sensation to capture those things. So that's kind of the, the first part where we have these things threatening us. Then Kant says, but aha, if you remember back to his idea of how our mind works last week, we've got the sensation and, and that's the part of our mind that's being overwhelmed in these cases. But we also have this uh, capacity for understanding, our ability to form cons concepts or ideas of things. So even though looking at the starry skies at night outstrips the ability of our senses to grasp how many stars they are, we can form concepts like the concept of two or three or 560 billion and we can think about huge numbers by using these number concepts. I can think about the idea of 682 billion stars, even though when I try to like capture that in my vision, ugh, it's going to outstrip my senses. But I have this amazing mental property of the understanding that gives me concepts like billions and trillions, and therefore I'm able to overcome this limitation of my senses by using my concepts. And it's the feeling that I get when I realize, oh, this is so cool. I've got this amazing, unique human capacity to form concepts of billions and trillions that allows me to overcome uh, the, the, uh, the weakness of my senses in capturing really big stuff. So that is Kant's notion of the mathematically sublime. Now he also has the second notion, the notion of the dynamic sublime. And with the dynamic sublime, what is threatened in us is our own physical well-being. We realize, oh man, you know, humans are tiny and fragile and easily killed. And that can be very frightening to consider, especially if you go out and say, look at the ocean during a storm and you realize, oh my gosh, that can just snap me in half like I'm nothing. Or if you say, um, 
I, I don't know, look upon uh, a tornado and realize, oh yeah, that threatens my physical well-being as well. So we have this sense of, ooh, being threatened by the powerful forces of nature which are able to overwhelm us. But yet, at the same time, Kant points out, yeah, but there's one thing that you and I have that this tornado or the giant storm at sea doesn't have. We again have this ability for understanding, for having these concepts in which we're able to look out at the world and think about the world and categorize it and reason about it. And that huge wave on the ocean, however powerful it is, it doesn't have that capacity. That giant tornado, that fire tornado out in California, that doesn't have the capacity to understand and think about us the way we are able to understand and think about that tornado and conceptualize it as a tornado. And once you realize that, oh, you get this feeling of the sublime where you realize, oh yes, there's lots of stuff in the world that threatens my physical well-being, and yet I have some power over nature that it doesn't have over me. I'm able to think about it in a way that it's never able to think about me. And so, again, we have this feeling of the sublime where we feel ourselves having this ability and power to, uh, to, to confront and overcome things that are otherwise seriously dangerous and threatening to us. And so Kant thinks, yes, there are certain sorts of art that put us in this position where we can contemplate the danger and the immensity of the universe that threatens to overcome and overwhelm us and yet allows us, nonetheless, in the safety of the art gallery to recognize our own superiority when it comes to our intellect and give us this feeling of the sublime.